Hello and welcome to Views from the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and M&A in Canada. My name is Mario Negro and I'm a partner in the Private Equity and M&A group at Steichman Elliott. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome Brian Fawnen. Brian is a partner at Osprey Capital. Osprey is a leading sell-side advisor in the middle market. And Brian, I want to thank you for joining us and welcome. Thanks for having me, Mario. Brian, we always start our podcast by asking our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves. And you've been active in the market for a long time. <laughs> Lots to talk about. So I'd love to start by learning a little bit about you and the work you do at Osprey. Yeah, I won't quantify the length of time, but I have been in the market a long time. I've actually spent my career in the capital market, really the first half working in investment banking, but on the public market side. And within that realm, I sort of started as an institutional equity analyst to begin with. After half a dozen years or so, I sort of took that analytical experience and moved over into finance, largely raising equity capital and facilitating M&A transactions for our publicly traded customers. As the markets evolved, I decided to change my focus slightly and look more to the private capital side of the business, spending an initial couple of years in the venture capital game, funding tech-based startups. After that experience, which was exciting in its own, I decided to return back to more traditional investment banking. And then I joined Osprey about a dozen years ago or so. Osprey itself, Osprey Capital Partners, as Mara had mentioned, we are a leading independent mid-market investment banking group based here in Toronto. We have offices in Calgary, Winnipeg, and Halifax. Our focus is largely on working with private Canadian business owners to facilitate their succession plans, finding the right buyer, offering the right price and the right terms. As well, we also work with companies to help shore up the balance sheet when necessary by providing access to debt and equity capital. I am going to take advantage of your years of experience, Brian, to give our viewers a perspective on the deal process itself and what you've seen over all these years of service that you've provided to the market. And want to get your perspective on, you know, obviously there's a lot that's happened in the last three years with COVID, but you've been in this space a long time and seen the evolution of the deal process in the middle market, get your thoughts on things that you see have changed. I mean, the market has evolved so much, frankly, even just the last three, three years, it seems, but love to get your perspective on some of the things you've seen over time that have changed from when you started and what you see is unique about the market that we have today from where we were. The major change that I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years is really the advent and now the prevalence of private equity and private equity as, you know, the buyer, the largest buyer pool out there for, for entrepreneurial companies that are looking to sell. It's largely come out of a period of low interest rates, rapidly rising real estate prices. It, it left many investors looking for alternate places to invest their money. In the private equity world, seemingly offer them good diversification. The mad push into private equity has dramatically changed the market of buyers for private companies. You know, this was when I started out in the M&A side, it was almost 100% strategic, very few financial buyers, and they were usually large. You know, the names that everybody knows, like KKR, things like that were around. But the prevalence today, it's really unprecedented. Now we're seeing private equity funds or companies that are owned by private equity funds representing 80 to 90% of the bona fide buyer pool in any process. And it's had a number of impacts on the market. Probably the, the best one for all is the fact that generally valuations have risen as a result of having private equity in the market. Generally, these are professional investors. They are less risk averse than strategic companies, more likely to use debt and leverage in an acquisition and allowing them to pay more. It has changed the speed with which transactions happen uh, prior to the last three years, deals were getting done in unbelievable timeframes, quick timeframes, whereas actually the private equity groups were using time as the new money. So they might not offer the best, you know, the most turns of value, but they could close a deal in 30 days or 45 days. And that was very attractive to many buyers. So there's been all sorts of changes as a result of it. And we continue to see that happening even more and more every year we get approached daily by, by new groups that are looking to invest in Canada and looking in, to invest in Canada, the Canadian mid-market. You know, and by all accounts, there's trillions of dollars in private equity funds floating around out there. And that's generally good for people who are looking to sell their business. Brian, when you talk about that phenomenon, and obviously I'm a product of that too, given the clients I represent and the deal activity, you know, I want to hear your sense. Will you go to a process now and you're trying to sell a business for an owner? 
how many of your buyers are private equity firms? Is it 50? You know, when you look at the buyer pool that's potentially out there, as a generally speaking, how big are they in terms of the representative part of your buyer pool? I would say, you know, not having any real definitive facts on it, but I mean, just experientially, I would say 80 to 90% of our buyers are private equity groups or strategic companies that are owned by private equity groups. And the real difference for us is that even if, say, you're looking at 20% of a pool, and we'll use 100 buyers just as a discussion point. So you've got 20 strategics out there. Out of those 20 strategics, maybe two or three are currently in the market to buy a company. But out of those 80 private equity groups, they're all in the market. They're all looking for something. They might not be looking for what you're selling, but they're all ready to buy. And that really changes everything, right? It makes the process much more efficient. So we don't have to count on that, like, because your best buyer might be a strategic buyer, but maybe they're not ready to be buying at that time. So I'd say 80 to 90% of the bona fide buyers are private equity groups or the companies that are owned by private equity groups. And, you know, Osprey is proudly a middle market advisory firm and really sells itself on representing owners and operators of businesses that are in the middle market. And when we talk about those private equity buyers, so traditionally, as you said, I think very well said, people used to think of them as like these big brands like KKR and Carlisle, but more and more and more, I know from my practice, when I get your perspective is they're not just buyers of large companies, they're buyers of small companies. And frankly, surprisingly how small they are willing to look at all sizes and frankly, almost at all sectors. But do you see them active in any particular sector space size or in your practice, it's, as you point out, they're kind of in every process. Yeah, I'd say they're in every process and exactly as you referred to or alluded to there, Mario, with the advent of more and more search funds in Canada, which you have been instrumental in, in straightening that market, it has gone significantly down market in terms of size wise. So even a company that's doing a million or even sometimes a half a million dollars in earnings can look at an op, you know, be in a process where there is a financial buyer looking to come in and help or looking to come in and buy their business. So that's, it's really democratized it. It's taken it out of the, um, just the soup, just the large companies, you know, the global companies that are being looked at by the huge private equity funds. So it's right across the spectrum. And now we're even seeing a lot of the private equity groups opening up different funds like growth strategy funds and secondary funds, all trying to get into the private market once again, any way to get their hook into it. So it's really quite fascinating how quickly it's all moved. I've represented sellers and I'd say the word private equity and they have some or, you know, understanding or idea of what they are based on whatever it is, social media or TV or are you finding there's an evolution amongst buyers in terms of understanding what private equity brings to the process and what the value that they add. I mean, you're, you know, you talk to owners all the time. What you mentioned private equity, you tell them that they're a big part of the buyer pool. What kind of feedback do you get? Has it been an evolution amongst owner operators in selling to private equity? I would say so. I, I think just because of the prevalence. So, you know, somebody's always got a buddy who sold a company to a private equity group, but that harboring in the background of, in all of these, there's still that uncertainty. Because back in the early days, of course, all we heard about was leverage buyouts and these guys coming in and, you know, stripping out costs and firing everybody and trying to increase the bottom line. That really is old school thinking. Well, it's, I guess, in the leverage buyout world, it's still out there. But predominantly, private equity groups are very good owners of businesses. As I like to tell our clients, these guys are investors. They're professional investors. Their job is to buy a company, grow a company, and sell a company. So they don't want to own your business. They want to work with you to grow your business. So for an individual who wants to continue on in their business after they sell the bulk of it, you can use the private equity group's capital to grow your business, which is fantastic. And they really can be a great partner. They're going to fill out your management team. They're going to offer great advice from a board seat perspective, they're going to make introductions to other companies and their portfolios and other groups throughout North America, which really for the right business is an incredible opportunity to really leverage all of that knowledge and money and grow the business and at the same time, put enough away in your genes to ensure that you and your family are secure for a long time. So there's still a little bit of that bogeyman-ish idea about private equity, but largely I think we're seeing that's falling by the wayside. 
And just on that point, if, and obviously this is a construct, but you know, we always in our world say, if all things being equal, you have a private equity firm. And of course things are not always equal, but private equity firms are kind of head to head with a, a strategic and kind of, you know, they're generally around the same zone. People will lean towards a strategic, just lean for what they know over what they don't know. Do you find that to be the case or is uh, to your point, like that also is changing? There isn't necessarily a strategic advantage anymore the way there used to be historically in the marketplace where the owner operator would want to sell to somebody who, who kind of quote unquote has a, you know, a history of their business. I don't know if I can say in a head to head situation, it would be, you know, maybe 50, 50, but which is not really an answer, but, um, it's a good question. We are rarely in a situation where we see them head to head with same terms. You know, it's all pricing is the same terms are the same. A lot of the times people feel that if they sell to a strategic, they're going to, you know, allow the reputation and the legacy to continue, but that's not necessarily the case either. So yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I can't really, uh, can't really say off the top of my head, which, uh, we, but, we see but, more of that or not. I think what, where I want to get a sense from you is, I mean, as a general comment, obviously deal factors rule, the prejudice isn't what it used to be. No, the prejudice and frankly, money talks, right? Yeah. And the good thing about private equity groups largely is that the right private equity group will have a good foundation in the industry that our client is in. So it's not like the client has to educate them. The client has to tell them what it is. Typically, the private equity group would have a broader understanding of the business as a whole and all the nuances of it. So they're coming in with a strong knowledge base behind them. And as a result, that keeps the owner, gives the owner confidence that on a go forward basis, they're going to run their company properly. You know, if I can ask one more question on this topic and just, you know, understanding how private equities act and obviously getting your perspective because you're close to the ground with the owners, but you know, private equity firms often want owners to roll over. You know, they prefer that they, you know, take some of their proceeds and you kind know, of reinvest it as shareholders of the business going forward, post-closing. Are you finding that, that owners are more open to that? I mean, do you see the history of that in terms of that request from private equity firms? I'm curious what your perspective is when a private equity firm ask sometimes insists as part of its deal that the seller roll over 10, 20 percent of their purchase price and become a shareholder going forward. Get your perspective on the evolution of that and how that plays out to owner operators today. You know, if you talk about the mid mark, it goes to this whole idea that private equity groups don't want to operate your business. They want to back good operators, right? Good operator keeping equity in the business is going to keep them interested in the business. It's going to allow the private equity group to bolster their management team around them and knowing that the guidance that the owner operator has always had will continue on for a number of years. It can be one year up to five years typically. And interestingly, from a, an owner's perspective, if you keep 20% of your operation when the private equity group comes in and five years down the road, the private equity company decides they're going to resell your business, that 20% could be worth more than the original 80% that you sold. So, and in the interim, you've had, like say you've had all the fun of running your business and none of the hassles because the private equity group, you can use their capital. They'll help you with all your back office stuff, all of that stuff. So it takes all that mundane things off your hands and allows you to really have the most fun with somebody else's money. So I think that that in the mid market is truly, um, it, it's really beneficial to hang on. And frankly, if you come to us and say, I want to sell a hundred percent of my business that will reduce the buyer pool, the private equity buyer pool in half because many of them just won't do hundred percent because, you know, everybody wants to transition. Some of them short transitions, some of them long transitions, but nobody likes to write a hundred percent check and have the senior management team walk away. And Brian, you and I are, share the same practice. So we see the same type of people out there when we talk about private equity. I mean, I get your perspective, but it is at least when it comes to the bid market, primarily U.S. private equity, U.S. mid-market funds. And obviously there is a growing players in the smaller deals like search funds. But I mean, get your perspective, if you see it different from mine, when we're talking about private equity, it tends to be U.S. capital coming here to Canada to do deals. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, the issue in Canada is that we've got really good big funds and we've got a lot of small search funds and things like that, which are at small end of the game, that the middle is kind of missing here. 
that's slowly evolving. Now I'm seeing it just, you know, in the last year or so, I've seen more groups come out that are not search funds, but just usually family offices. We're looking to put together a small portfolio of companies, two or three companies. So they'd be more like a traditional private equity group. But yeah, just by the size and the amount of dollars that are in the U.S. market, we're seeing them come up here. And I'm always amazed at how many groups that we talk to on a regular basis that have never even looked at Canada as an opportunity. I was talking to a group just this morning. It's like, you know, we never, we never even thought Canada would be a good place to do business. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, it's crazy times. But anyway, we're seeing a lot more of them up here, but they are predominantly U.S., yeah. Uh, you brought a great point to transition, which is, you know, I want to talk a bit about your perspectives on the market that we're in and deal activity and all. And obviously, 21 was a wild and crazy year. And, and obviously, 22 was a different story. And, and your perspective on what you're seeing for 23 and talk a bit about where we're at with the market. I don't work unless we have sellers. So I'm hoping you're going to say there's still sellers out there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't work unless we have sellers either. So. 22 is an interesting market, right? Half, about halfway through from our perspective, things started to soften. So our, our clients' results started to soften. And that was a result of everything from supply chain issues working through, interest rates starting to rise, impact of global calamities, wars, and things like that. All of that started to have more of an impact. And so buyers were starting to sort of step back a little bit, you know, looking to put more structure in transactions. That tended to scare off some sellers because, of course, they were used to 2021 when it was the Wild West out there. You could ask for anything and people would give it to you just to buy your business. So there was a bit of a rationalization in terms of value of businesses. And I've seen this happen before. I tend to block it out of my mind after it's done, but it had happened a number of cycles. And it takes a while for that, the reconciliation on both sides of valuation to come to terms. So you've got buyers who want to pay less or put more structure. You've got sellers who aren't willing to come down from their lofty multiples. But typically, you know, businesses as a whole, I would say, are not doing quite as well now as they were in the previous two years. So there seems to be now people are starting to understand that, okay, so maybe they won't get the crazy multiple that they could have gotten 21. But uh, as long as the business is still solid and there's good growth opportunities, you know, we haven't really seen multiples decrease dramatically, but we're definitely going to see more structure, I think, as we go into 23. You know, I always ask our guests to talk a little bit about where they see the market going. And I know you've kind of lent this there. I call it the crystal ball question. I mean, are you planning for a strong 23? Uh, what's your sense of where this market's going to go, given the macro forces and all? Yeah, you know... There is still a ton of money out there. And really, there's almost a sense of desperation. And I'll say that in a nice way from the private equity side, only because I think the amount of product that sort of came off the market in late 22, just because of this misalignment and valuation expectations and some results were going down as well. So we've been, you know, we were just talking about this the other day. I've had more calls from private equity groups in the last couple of months than I've seen in any the beginning of any first year period, any first quarter, people just dying to get the money out there, which is great for sellers. And so I think we just need to get the word out. And because there's still lots of businesses, I know a lot of people were hurt from COVID and then hurt from the supply chain issues and hurt from interest rates, but they just need to buckle down and make sure that the business is buyer ready. And there's no reason why it couldn't be a good year. No reason at all that 2023, all the components are there. They just got all sort of gel together to make it happen. Now, I know, Brian, you and I have talked about this in the past. We've been around for other recessions. I shouldn't use the R word, but periods where the economy kind of flattened out. And, um, you know, in the past, I remember this from 08 and 2000, sellers went to the sidelines. They were going to wait and see. They were going to ride it out, you know, grow, wait, just, you know, focus on resilience of their company instead of selling. Have you seen that? Like you're talking to sellers all the time. Have you seen People say to you, you know, with this market, I'm going to hold off selling. I'll wait, I'll punt. Or people still who are interested in selling still going forward. Yeah, I would say that largely we haven't seen a lot of people go to the sidelines. And it sort of depends on why you're selling, right? The people who decided to pull their transactions in the last six to eight months have been people who are trying to maybe tap into a hot marketplace 
they're still young enough that they've got a number of years left. They can run their business. They can wait for the next cycle. But we always tell people, like, if you don't go now, you've got to wait a couple of years. So depending on what your ultimate goal is and why you're trying to sell today, if you're a strong company that's got good growth, historically good growth, even if this last period has been a bit wonky, people tend to discount that from a seller's or a buyer's perspective. So there's still opportunity. But overall, I would say we haven't seen as much sidelining as we used to see in previous times, like 08 or 09. I agree there was way more people then who were um, who went to the sidelines. But now I think people are just hesitant. So we're doing a lot more hand-holding and a lot, lot more sort of explaining where the market is and how to make sure that their businesses show best to buyers, I think. Brian, I want to thank you for joining us. I say this with the best of intentions. I, you know, I hope uh, we work together for another 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to want to see you in 30 years, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, but look, it's been a pleasure to have you join us. And obviously, you know, your long years of service and your perspective is deeply appreciated. And thank you for joining us on the podcast and for giving us your perspective on the market. Well, thanks, Mayor. I really appreciate you having me on. And it was a pleasure chatting with you as well. 